From the opinion pages of the Wall Street Journal, this is Potomac Watch. Welcome back. Let's move on to Missouri. The Senate primary there is also fascinating, and there are a whole slew of candidates in the race. But the top two seem to be Attorney General Eric Schmidt and former Governor Eric Greitens. And again, the polling there looks like it's close enough that it could be anybody's game. But there has been a notable effort by Republican strategists, it seems, in recent days to block Eric Greitens from getting the nomination. He resigned the governorship in 2018 amid scandal. He has recently denied some abuse allegations made by his ex-wife. And Kim, I don't know about you, but to my eye, maybe Eric Greitens is the one candidate who could lose a state like Missouri for the Republican Party. Yeah, I mean, this guy has a lot of baggage. Obviously, he resigned in 2018 over a very ugly sex scandal. And to be clear, there is no question that he was engaged in some infidelity. There were more questions over what were claims of blackmail, etc. in the end. But the reality is, is he didn't resign until this had gone all the way to the Missouri legislature. And they looked as though they were going to impeach him. Since that time, he disappeared for a while. But when he came back on the scene, his former wife has since lodged some accusations of spousal abuse, which he has denied. I want to be very clear on that. Then he also caused a bit of a controversy with an ad he ran a while back in which he said he was going to go to the Senate so that he could go rhino hunting, showed him holding firearms, breaking into a house. It was very aggressive, uh, a very aggressive ad. And so in the wake of that, and in light of those concerns about his ability to actually win the seat. It has been quite remarkable. The past month in particular, there have been a number of top-tier Missouri Republicans that have banded together, collected a lot of money, and have been running a barrage of ads against him. And whereas Greitens was seen to be winning this race about six or eight weeks ago, there is some question now just about how far he has fallen in the polls. A lot of the recent polling has said he's now in third place and that the leader is in fact, the Missouri Attorney General Eric Schmidt. And that brings us to President Trump's intervention on Monday in this race. In the morning, he posted on his social network site that he was going to be making a big endorsement, and Missouri, I'm sure, was waiting with bated breath. And remember, the top two candidates in the polling here are Eric Schmidt and Eric Greitens. And let me read from what is maybe one of the most Trumpy Trump statements of all time. He says, I trust the great people of Missouri on this one to make up their own minds, much as they did when they gave me landslide victories in the 2016 and 2020 elections. And I'm therefore proud to announce that Eric has my complete and total endorsement. And this is classic Trump. I think it's funny. It's unconventional. It's entirely self-serving. So both Eric Greitens and Eric Schmidt have now claimed that endorsement, saying they're proud to be endorsed by the president. There's a third minor candidate in the race named Eric McElroy. Maybe he is thrilled at this as well. And then here's a statement from Congressman Billy Long, who's also running for the Senate nomination. He says that President Trump said to pick between the two Eric's. And he says, look at your ballot. Eric Schmidt is on line two. Eric Greitens is on line four. And I'm between them on line three. And so (laughs) I don't know what to make of this, Kim. I mean... President Trump gets attention. He puts himself in a position where if either of these Eric's wins, or I guess the third Eric, if he comes from behind, he can take credit either way. But what a spectacle. It's absolutely bizarre and absurd. (laughs) You know, this is a former president of the United States. He should probably be expected to clarify just which candidate he is endorsing in a major Senate race. (laughs) Now, maybe it was meant to be humorous. Maybe it was his way of actually not endorsing anyone in this race, because I would point out he has been under enormous pressure to, in fact, declare himself in this race. Eric Greitens has been making open bids to get his endorsement. And it could be that the president was also getting some advice from advisors about how politically precarious it could be to wade into this race. And so, again, it could be an amusement factor that the joke may be, in fact, the joke. We'll see if he comes out and later explains any more who he actually meant. (laughs) Well, this is your moment, listeners. One more thought on this. If you know anyone named Eric, today is the day you can text them, write them an email, and congratulate them on getting President Trump's full and complete endorsement here. 
But Kim, what do you make of the larger dynamic here? I mean, let's say that we get to the end of November and Republicans still are facing a 50-50 Senate, or maybe they've lost a couple seats and we're having a Democratic Senate. And it seems like it's because of some of these candidates that won with Trump's endorsement, whether it's Dr. Oz, whether it's Herschel Walker, whether it's Eric Greitens, whether it's Blake Masters. I mean, do you think that that dynamic would change what's happening in the Republican Party at all and loosen Trump's grip, I guess, on some of these voters. I mean, my skepticism, I guess, comes from in part from the fact that we already saw a similar thing play out in the Georgia Senate runoffs in 2021, where President Trump went down there. And instead of really endorsing the candidates and saying that you need to elect David Perdue in order to salvage my agenda from President Biden, he went down there and he fixated on his own grievances about the 2020 election and his loss. And the result was those Republican candidates lost. And we've gotten into this situation where we have a 50-50 Senate directly as a result of that. Yeah, it's really hard to say. I mean, first of all, we have to get to the election. And I think that there's obviously a bigger dynamic at play here than simply Trump endorsements. You have a public that is very unhappy with this current White House inflation, gas prices, baby formula shortages, questions about the president's handling of overseas questions. Um, So there's a lot of anger and frustration among the electorate. And while some of these races are very close and there might have been some candidates that are controversial, you just don't know how much that anger might still propel Republicans over the finish line. I've certainly seen that happen in the past. You've got a lot of negative media coverage about all of these people right now. But as the election grows closer and people tune into these issues, sometimes it does end up refocusing that anger. And you could end up seeing a lot of these people, even if they're behind at the moment, win their races. Now, if they do lose, as you said, here's one problem for Donald Trump is that unlike the House, where I think some of his endorsements have had more mixed results in terms of those that he's actually backed and whether or not they've won, he's had a pretty good run in his Senate endorsements. And so another way of saying this is that he kind of owns a lot of these people. And yes, if they fail to get across the finish line, I think it certainly will say something about him. You can't have it both ways. You can't claim that because I gave an endorsement, this person won. But if they didn't win, it's not my fault. And so it may cause some of the Republican to rethink that. I already believe that there is some loosening, obviously, of Donald Trump's control over the party. But this is a very important dynamic to watch. And it could also be influencing his decision to get into the race early. Uh, My last thought, a couple of other things I'm keeping my eyes on are just the Trump and Pence dynamic. It is interesting to see them on separate sides of some of these elections and sometimes going out and having rallies for their endorsed candidates on the same day, a little bit of counter programming there. And then also, I wonder if we get to the end of November, if we will see any difference in how these races played out between states that have runoffs for Republican primaries and Democratic primaries and states that do not. Because in some states like Georgia, in order to win, you have to be above 50 percent. And so if there's 10 candidates in the race, they take the top two if nobody gets above 50% and then they make them run against each other in a runoff. And there are other states where they don't do that. So there are states where you can get the Republican nomination in a field of 10 candidates with only, you know, a third of the vote if you're the top vote getter. And so uh, I will be curious to see if how that plays out too, Kim. Yeah, that is a really good point because all of these states have different voting rules. And also, I would note that some are having entirely new voting systems this time. Let's not forget that we still have an interesting Senate primary going on in Alaska, where Lisa Murkowski is facing a challenger. But what's interesting is that the state of Alaska, for the first time, is having an entirely open primary with a lot of candidates on the ballot, and then is going to have ranked choice voting in their general election, which is all new for the voters in that state and and could throw up some really curious results, too. Thank you, Kim, and thank you all for listening. You can email us at pwpodcast at wsj.com. If you like the show, please hit that subscribe button on your favorite podcast app, and we'll be back tomorrow with another edition of Potomac Watch.